And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Murphy. Michael had a distinguished career in Ireland and at University College Cork, but he's here today because he is president of the European University Association, a very large gathering, all, I think getting on for a thousand universities now uh, in the group. And Michael, we look forward very much to your perspective. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Your Excellencies and uh, President Salama, can I firstly convey sincere thanks for this invitation? Uh, it is a, a real honor to address you here today, and of course those who are with us virtually, uh, perhaps a very good example of emerging university education, some learning in a community of presence, some live but distant, and of course others enjoying recordings anywhere, anytime, at a later point. It's an honor. I have organized my remarks firstly to address uh, some predictions on the future role and shape of universities. It's perhaps primarily a European perspective but one can expect uh, largely similar macroscopic trends everywhere in the world. And then I will make some comments on how change may be facilitated. Last week, as David pointed out, there was a very important conference in Barcelona, the UNESCO World Conference on Higher Education. And I will allude to some of the highlights of that meeting in the course of my remarks. One year ago, the European University Association published a position paper, and we called it Universities Without Walls. It's a vision for universities over the next 10 to 15 years, and it was the culmination of a year-long consultation with over 100 experts from universities uh, colleagues from other continents, governments, the European Commission, the business community, and civic society. And we asked them to imagine how universities must change in the coming decade to meet the needs of society as they evolve. As David pointed out, the EUA represents over 800 universities across Europe, across 49 countries, uh, members of the European higher education area, and it also includes the national associations of 34 countries. Given that diversity, it was surprising how broad a consensus there was on the challenges facing global society, and they resonated in Professor Salama's address a few minutes ago. Our world is going through rapid change, and that change is accelerating. And all agree that universities must play a key part in addressing these challenges. Top of the list, environmental sustainability, climate change that must be faced up to, while at the same time sustaining economic well-being. That's a challenge. Digitalization and artificial intelligence were referred to, uh, but particularly affecting the workplace. And this provides a very big challenge to universities because we have to imagine the new workplace and the new civic space. And we have to provide students with the skills to compete with and to use artificial intelligence. Another challenge globally is the scale of demographic shifts, which are impacting many countries. Some in the developed world are finding falling birth rates and aging populations. And 
on average, uh, older populations. In other countries, particularly in the global south, there is a rapidly increasing population. And at the same time, migration, whether due to war or whether due to climate change, is impacting a lot of countries at this point. Societal polarization. In many countries, due to growing inequalities and lack of opportunity, in some countries, exacerbated by misinformation through social media, destabilizing democratic societies in particular, and no country is immune. We also have to deal with global geopolitical realignment, which is undermining cooperation when global collaboration is most needed. In particular, the United States and China are competing ever more aggressively for economic and political power. Russia longs for the restoration of an empire and has gone to war to seek that goal. And in this part of the world where we are standing today, in Europe, many calls for a stronger Europe to act as a go-between in ever more complex geopolitical competitions. Needless to say, the pandemic dramatically accelerated change in most societal sectors, and not least, it has driven dramatic change in higher education. And finally, if we were doing this consultation this year, there would now be reference to food shortages, energy shortages, supply chain challenges, inflation. It's a very complex menu. We found consensus on the challenges, but we also found a surprising degree of agreement on what universities must do. Everyone agreed that universities have an ever more important role to play in addressing these challenges, but that universities too need to evolve as quickly as society is changing and in many different ways. So we chose a title universities without walls to symbolize the fundamental philosophy of most of the themes in the vision. The first headline, universities must be more open, certainly more transformative, more engaged in society, and greatly more transnational. Universities without walls means no more ivory towers. It means blended campuses, combining traditional learning on campus with online learning. And this will be the only way that universities can deliver impactful lifelong learning, which was a theme heard much at last week's UNESCO conference. Students must learn much more outside the campus, in the workplace, experiential learning, it's called, but not just in business, but also in civic, social, and cultural spaces, depending on their disciplines. Some of you will have read a very interesting book by the Lebanese-American educator, Joseph Aoun, who is now president of Northeastern University in Boston. He entitled his book, Robot Proof, Higher Education, in the age of artificial intelligence. And in his view, experiential learning will be critical to imbuing learners with the skills to thrive in the future workplace. In fact, it will be the key feature of our new, open, porous university. The model is designed to sharpen students' real-world problem-solving skills foster creative thinking, and to imbue them with better work-ready interpersonal skills. We also see staff moving regularly between campus and the workplace, bi-directional staff mobility. And this will be a means by which course content is up to date. And it will ensure that staff's own skills 
are updated continuously. All take the view that curriculum design must involve societal stakeholders to ensure that it is fit for purpose and that it is relevant. And we see curriculum advisory boards, including experts from outside the university, as well as the faculty, but, this, the, but the external experts must be influential, not just window dressing or a nice to have, which is commonly the case today. Our universities must be deeply embedded in their regions, and they must collaborate not only with business and industry, but with civic society broadly. And there was a very strong emphasis in consultations of uh, universities as key actors leading regional innovation, economic, business, and public policy innovation. So universities must partner with the leaders in all of these domains to help shape and support the economies and the civic well-being of our regional communities. Beyond our regions, universities must be deeply networked within countries, across borders, whether in Europe or beyond in the wider world, with our students and staff and researchers moving freely between them for joint degrees, for research, and especially for intercultural learning. Universities will have to increase international cooperation as a means of driving transnational solidarity so that all parts of the world succeed. In Europe, we are testing this idea with the new European University Alliances, and some of them are embracing transnational campuses piloting the new model, which should be applicable anywhere. Universities will continue to be bridge builders between societies, especially, and most especially, when their governments may be in conflict. This, of course, will all demand new models of academic governance and finance governance that will have to be designed to oversee this new porous interconnected university model. So the first message, openness, walls tumbling down, porous institutions. The second key theme that emerged was that universities must be committed to global sustainability and to diversity. Again, highlighted by uh, Professor Salama in his remarks. Our overarching goals in the university sector in the coming decade must be to support society to attain the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It must be the primary objective across all university missions in education, in research, in innovation, and in culture. And our campuses must be exemplary role models for the rest of society in embracing green, sustainable practices. We must ensure that the curriculum content is SDG informed, and we must research solutions to SDG challenges in a sustainable fashion. We must embrace diversity in university missions across the world. We in Europe believe that diversity is a strength of our higher education system. Wherever institutions sit on the mission spectrum, all must be valued equally. Strong regional universities serving their local communities collectively are as important or maybe more important to society as the prominent globally famous research intensive institutions. And it goes without saying that universities in all parts of the world must embrace diversity in their community composition. The students and the staff must mirror in every way possible the diversity of their society. Now, onto some uh, comments on the key missions of universities and how they must evolve. And I will begin with learning and teaching. Learning will change. 
it will no longer be the preserve of 18 to 23 year olds, undergraduates, because learning will take place over a lifetime. It will be full time, yes, for youth in most cases, but not all. And learning will be enmeshed into the work and leisure time of most citizens. Increased life expectancy, demand that people undergo career changes several times during life, and workplace skills are evolving at an ever faster pace so that lifelong learning, the demand for it, will be unprecedented and demand unprecedented flexibilities of our universities in program delivery, in assessment, and in the integration of accredited micro-credentials. We have to get accustomed to the concept of students, of citizens, designing their own learning portfolios, many moving between different institutions, accumulating credits. Yes, we will continue to have bachelor's, master's, and doctoral programs, but they may be acquired in the traditional way or by others through lifetime accumulation of credits. The new model of education will treat learners differently, not as sponges of established facts, but as partners in the co-creation of understanding and application. Because how to interpret and how to apply new knowledge, not the acquisition and regurgitation of facts, will be a bigger focus of higher education. Again, as Professor Salama said a moment ago, digitalization will be a key enabler, and it will greatly increase opportunities for international and intercultural learning. But it will never replace in-person mobility. It will complement that mobility, and it will grow opportunity for new international experiences for millions of students for whom physical mobility has been and will be beyond their means. Democratization of international mobility will be a key benefit of digitalization. But the physical campus will continue because it will be a crucial place for social interaction, for dialogue, a place where encounters that challenge and inspire will take place, a quiet space for focused learning, extracurricular learning, and research. And the virtual campus, of course, will make the university ubiquitous. And finally, in the learning space, most experts anticipate substantial benefits from the adoption of learning analytics based on AI frameworks that will enable more bespoke, individualized student learning support. Lots of comments on research evolution. Its research will evolve greatly. There will be a bigger emphasis on a healthier research culture, on strong ethical frameworks, and on integrity in research to grow and to sustain societal trust in science and expertise. After many years of decline, university research regained much credibility during the pandemic, and we must be careful now to protect those gains in the years ahead. Open science will be the principal vehicle for sharing data and publications. Publishing research openly, storing the original research data in openly accessible repositories will help restore trust in evidence and in expertise. Open science was highlighted in Barcelona. It will grow the community of scientists and researchers across the world by reducing barriers to access access to data for scientists in all parts. Researchers everywhere will grow to appreciate the opportunity that open science offers to accelerate the process of verification of new research findings. It should facilitate the early identification of error 
It should co combat the curse of publication bias that currently favors publications of positive results over equally valid and important negative research findings. It can open up participation in research, the entire global community, and thus the opportunity to develop global rather than traditional regional collaborations. Today, different parts of the world are at different stages of development in open science. Latin America, for example, is far ahead of Europe in its embrace of open access, particularly what's called diamond publishing, where the, both publishing and access to scientific articles are free. So all regions can learn from each other. Open science has the potential to combat brain drain, which is a particular downside of student and researcher mobility, because it will diminish the need to migrate to where the science is, traditionally in the richer developed world. In this era, solidarity must be the overarching principle as we go forward if all parts of the world are to play their part in combating global challenges. Can I say that on behalf of EUA, we have uh, embraced the global approach to uh, open science and we invite all to join the UNESCO Global Open Science Partnership, working together towards a global consensus on transition to open science. And I will just mention for a moment a few challenges in this domain that require cooperation from all parts. At a macroscopic level, there are legislative, regulatory, and technical obstacles. Digital infrastructure platforms are at different stages of development in different regions, and investment is needed. A common science cloud is needed. Europe is currently investing about a billion euros in a science cloud. And once proof of concept is established, in our view, access to it should be extended internationally. But data protection and copyright laws will need harmonization. We also need a common, high quality, global governance framework for open science because it can be misused. When you ease the process of publishing in a culture of publish or perish, there may be a temptation to publish prematurely before ideas have matured. There is a risk of erroneous interpretation of data and there is a risk of dissemination of fake scientific news. We saw all of that, of course, during the COVID pandemic thus the need for governance. And finally, we can also think of specific challenges relating to equity, diversity, and inclusion in attaining open access and open science, because, as I have said a moment ago, different countries and institutions are at different stages of development. Some have made substantial progress, others have only recently initiated activities, and it is crucial that support is provided and that best practice is exchanged and that political and institutional engagement is encouraged so that resources are made available as necessary and as widely as possible. We need to see more citizen engagement with research, citizen science. And we see roles for citizens in setting research priorities in our universities, in the governance of science, in its ethical evaluation, and in the implementation of research findings. There is debate about the most effective way of deploying resources for research. Some countries, such as USA, China, India, have espoused the concentration of resources in a small number of elite research-intensive universities. In Europe, we are prioritizing the concept of distributed excellence, distributed among deeply networked institutions as a means to minimize regional economic disparities 
inequalities and the polarization that flows therefrom. Reiterating a key point, we must show commitment to sustainability of research itself in our universities. We have to ensure that research careers remain attractive to young graduates through good employment terms and conditions. We must support young researchers in diversifying their career ambitions. Most today aspire to academic careers, though we know that only 10% will ever find a career in academia. So we have to revise our training of researchers, our, our systems and methodologies, to allow for diverse employment roles in the new knowledge economy and society. And final comment on research, we've spoken for over a decade of the importance of interdisciplinarity to solve complex challenges, but our universities, regulatory and funding agencies must work much harder to foster the degree of interdisciplinarity needed and particularly to honor the complementarity of the humanities and social sciences with the more influential STEM disciplines. Last comments on missions relate to our third mission in universities, that is societal engagement. I've mentioned the key leadership role of universities in economic, and civic advancement in our regions and in our countries. But there is an emerging consensus that academics in our universities must engage more in political discourse, providing the data and the evidence to better inform public policy. We must participate more in public debate and we must grow our influence, regrow our influence by connecting more effectively with our graduates who are an ever-growing cohort of champions of universities within our societies. Greater openness must include more representation of society in the governance of our universities, and it will have many benefits, not least ensuring that our missions remain tethered in the needs of society. But involvement of society in our governance will enhance public understanding of what we do, the importance of universities to the well-being of society, and it will encourage public ownership of our missions and hopefully grow societal and political willingness to invest in us to the degree needed. And finally, under third mission, in most countries, universities are the repositories of many of the cultural assets of our societies from museums to art galleries, to libraries, drama theaters, performance spaces, we house unique historic artifacts of our cultures. And our academic staff interpret those artifacts, their symbolism, what they represent. We are the guardians of our ethnic stories and collectively, we are important guarantors of sustained cultural diversity in the world. This responsibility will remain a key role into the future, and it must never be sacrificed in the face of growing pressures from governments to prioritize a more utilitarian role for our institutions. So that concludes what I would call a whistle-stop tour of the trajectory of our diverse missions in universities in the coming decade or so. The key words, openness, transparency, collaboration, globally networked, connected, porous, embedded in society. Many elements of this, of this vision, are already being implemented in many institutions across the world, but in many countries, there are still large gaps. And bridging the gap, those of you in London have heard about minding the gap on the tube, in the last few days, bridging the gap and ensuring implementation is critical. And in our document, Universities Without Walls, we set out some of the conditions. Universities must be autonomous and they must be accountable if we are to succeed. We must remain firmly grounded 
in core academic values, otherwise we will not succeed. Institutional autonomy will be fundamental to a strong university system globally. And academic freedom remains and will remain essential to individual, institutional, national and global success. And yes, universities must be accountable to society through appropriate national and transnational governance structures and by involving, as I said earlier, external societal stakeholders always in our governance. There will be many determinants of our success and some lie in the power of universities and others do not. So just a few words on what we can do as universities. Firstly, the strategic plan of every institution needs to be aligned with the vision that we have set out. And of course, implementation must promote SDGs above all. But strategy must align with the vision. Secondly, again reiterating a comment made by Professor Salama earlier, strong, competent university leadership is essential. And academic leadership appointments must exhibit competence, must value competence ahead of popularity. And professionalization of institutional management must be embraced more. In the past year at EUA, we've had a project on how universities in Europe prepare people for senior leadership. And it revealed that there's extraordinary diversity, what a surprise, across Europe. Some countries investing a lot in professional leadership development, and others acting as if leadership comes from divine inspiration. In my view, in the view of most, those countries that have professionalized university leadership demonstrate much stronger and more successful university systems than those that have not. We all need to be trained. Third point, when filling positions on university governance boards, we must make sure that external expertise plays a major role, I've said that, but a suggestion that in filling our boards, one or more positions should always be filled by experienced university leaders from other countries. Because by embracing international expertise, we reduce the likelihood that each of us will rediscover the wheel. Lastly, and also within our own power in universities, there is an urgent need to reform academic career assessment, to value all parts of the university mission equitably, and not just research performance, which is the traditional approach. The movement to reform assessment of research and of academic careers is gathering momentum, and it is essential if the vision for change is to be achieved, because performance incentives within the university community must align with these strategic goals if the vision for 2030 or beyond is to become real. And rounding the home bend, universities cannot succeed on their own. To achieve our goals, we have to enjoy the support of governments. How? Firstly, national regulatory frameworks have to provide the right balance between accountability and autonomy. The EUA autonomy scorecard reveals that the best performing university systems in Europe enjoy the greatest degree of freedom to manage their own affairs, freedom to organize academic affairs, to organize the university internally, to manage staff at an institutional level, to manage financial affairs. And of course, consistency in regulatory frameworks between countries will be critical if universities are to engage in successful cross-border networks and alliances, a key element of the vision. In many countries, regulatory frameworks of governments have taken on a new shape in recent years through national performance contracts between the state and universities, and these are useful accountability tools and most helpful when negotiated through dialogue. 
They vary in detail. Too many indicators are a clear sign of university micromanagement by the state. Academic freedom is often guaranteed in law, but we have to be particularly careful now and in the coming years of new covert forms of infringement through overly prescriptive performance contracts that I have just mentioned are policies that focus too much on top-down, mission-driven research at the expense of researcher-initiated inquiry. And finally, you've been waiting for it, the matter of funding. Innovation, growth, better performance require investment in universities. And we have to remember that without resources, universities will not compete or collaborate successfully. And in the coming decades, decades countries will only be as successful as their universities will be. So we all have work to do uh, in lobbying continuously and finding colleagues in society to support us for better investment and better regulation of our universities. Ladies and gentlemen, I was allotted 30 minutes to speak. I have exceeded that by three minutes, but we must now allow sufficient time for questions. Universities have served society for a thousand years. We have shown a remarkable capacity to adapt through the centuries. That's why we have survived. But I have little doubt that we have now arrived at a wise consensus on the next phase of that evolution. But all that remains is that we act collectively on our vision to achieve it. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.